And joining us now, great to welcome on our book talk segment, Rand Management. A really fascinating book. It's about World War II. It's kind of the uh, the prehistory of it, if you will, called 1941, Fighting the Shadow War, Divided America in a World at War. We're joined today by uh, Mark Wartman. He's up in uh, New Haven, Connecticut area, and he joined us by telephone. Mark, good to talk with you. How are you? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Good to speak with you. I'm doing fine. Yeah, I had a chance to to read through a little bit of the book. I didn't get a chance to read all of it yet. I'm looking forward to doing that. But this is really a kind of a fascinating story, uh, not only about World War II itself, but uh, how the U.S. got in it. But they were kind of more involved in the war than uh, I guess most people realize before uh, before Pearl Harbor, right? Yeah, there's the you know the most uh, the most widely. Uh, uh, most, the widest way in which people view that the arrival of the war is basically we were at peace and then suddenly we were attacked at Pearl Harbor uh, and we were then at war. Um, but a whole lot more was going on than that before Pearl Harbor. Um, we were uh, we were neck deep in the war in Europe with uh, U.S. ships uh, actually in uh, combat with German U-boats. Uh, this month in April of uh, 1941, a U.S. destroyer fired on what it believed to be a, a, an attacking U-boat. That's eight months before Pearl Harbor. Uh, in uh, May of 1941, an American naval aviator uh, who was in uh, flying with the Royal Air Force, as were a number of other, other American naval aviators, uh, was the one who spotted the Bismarck, which was uh, the great German battleship that uh, the British were desperate to find. And he was almost blown out of the sky by the uh, by the British uh, by the uh, Bismarck. Excuse mm. me. Um, in October 1941. Two American destroyers were hit by torpedoes. Uh, one of them was sunk. So American sailors and officers were dying well before Pearl Harbor. And uh, and that's just scratching the surface there. The, the, the history of it, I guess you also heard the story that uh, FDR, Roosevelt, uh, since the country was in the terrible depression at that time, uh, particularly after Pearl Harbor, or maybe they uh, kind of knew that was coming, but let it happen in a sense uh, so they could get into the war, which would have hopefully get the country out of uh, out of the Depression. I don't know. Do, do you find any truth in that? Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because uh, uh, the, the question of just how much FDR knew comes up all the time. Now, FDR wanted to get into the war with Germany. Uh, especially during 1941. He did not feel that the British alone would, uh, or the British even with the Russians, once they were drawn in, would be able to defeat Hitler and drive him, uh, his forces out of uh, continental Europe and North Africa. Uh, but the last thing he wanted was a two-ocean war. Mm -hmm. The U.S. was by no means prepared for that. Now, uh, the U.S. did understand that the Japanese were going to be making very aggressive moves, and the belief was that their fleet uh, and other forces were moving south from Japan, moving into Southeast Asia, Singapore, uh, very likely to attack in the Philippines, Taiwan, uh, and other places in Indonesia. There was not even inkling that the Japanese task force was on its way to Hawaii. Um, and any of those, any people who believe that FDR uh, was uh, willingly opened the door to, uh, uh, to death and devastation at, at Pearl Harbor is, is completely mistaken, yeah. completely mistaken. And again, you, again, you look through the, the history of, of America again, the military uh, uh, was not very uh, built up uh, heading into that. You had a lot of World War I surplus, right? I mean, it, we had to build up the military in a hurry at that point. We really weren't prepared. Yeah. Well, once, uh, once uh, with the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, the, the speed and extent to which American industry and uh, the American military needed to have a mass mobilization was, uh, was astounding to be able to face two uh, major powers that had uh, very 
very large military forces, many, many times larger than ours. Uh, it was extraordinary what had to be done, and we had a number of defeats um, and uh, some good luck that, uh, particularly in the Pacific, that uh, over the course of the next year and a half or so before uh, finally things were starting to get up to speed. Um, but uh, during the period before Pearl Harbor, actually, the United States had become what uh, FDR called the arsenal of democracy. We were providing uh, the armaments and weapons for nations that uh, the president had been designated by Congress to, uh, to choose to receive uh, American weaponry and other supplies uh, in order to fight in our national security interests. And so, uh, and even before that, the British and before the French were defeated, uh, the French had been uh, placing orders for weapons and other supplies from U.S. Uh, factories and farms and oil fields. So uh, the economy had actually uh, been improving significantly throughout that period, uh, but we still had a long way to go before we were able to really provide that sort of awesome might that uh, that astounded the world during World War II. Yeah. And despite all the, you know, the, obviously the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor and what was going on in Europe, there was a lot of uh, uh, thought uh, we should stay out of it. And, and you talk about it in the book, some of the, uh, you know, the characters of the time, uh, Lindbergh being one of them, really speaking out against uh, going into war, right? Uh, also, uh, Father Tom, Father Coughlin, I believe his name was, right? He made a lot of speeches on radio. So there's, there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. Yeah, there was um, uh, America, by and large, was an isolationist nation. We were by law neutral. Uh, uh, Congress had passed neutrality acts in the mid and late 1930s uh, that uh, tied the president's hands. We were not allowed to aid uh, foreign nations at war and uh, American troops were not allowed to fight foreign wars. Uh, uh, President Roosevelt did some constitutionally du dubious maneuvers to provide aid to the uh, Chinese in Asia in their fight against Japan and to the British in their fight against um, against Hitler. Um, but there was, uh, there was this very extensive isolationist uh, sentiment and movement in this country. Uh, you mentioned Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh had been to Nazi Germany. He had uh, reported on, gone on an aviation inspection tour there. He considered uh, aviation development to be really the hallmark of, of a society, uh, of an advanced society. And he was deeply impressed by Germany's uh, air might. Uh, in fact, he uh, conveyed his view that Germany was so uh, powerful uh, that it would not be possible for the British to defeat them. And Joseph Kennedy, uh, U.S. ambassador to London during the, uh, the period, he uh, basically said uh, the U.S. should not bother backing the British. They're going to be defeated, so hmm. why should we waste our, our uh, uh, military supplies on them? They'll just be lost to the Germans. Yeah, and then um, people, people forget how big a hero he was, though, for that flight he made, and a lot of people paid attention to him, right? Oh, yeah. No, he was a tremendously popular figure. So he became the uh, spokesperson for an organization called the Committee for America First. America First was the most influential anti-war organization in U.S. history. And when he spoke, the rallies would have thousands and even tens of thousands of people turning out. And his view was this, that the war in Europe was a matter for the, uh, of great power interest in Europe and that it, the U United States had nothing to do with that and that the U.S. should, uh, he said, put up its, its walls, uh, arm itself against attack, and nobody will be able to come across the ocean and attack us. Um, he believed that there was a, a darker side to his views as well. Uh, along with his um, uh, admiration for Nazi Germany, um, he also had uh, a very, um, well, I guess we would just have to call it flat-out anti-Semitic view. Right. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't anti-Semitic in, in the way uh, he would never have said, oh, I won't sit next to this 
person because she's Jewish. Uh, I won't work with this guy because he's Jewish. Uh, it was much more that he believed that Jews had uh, were not fully American and that they had interests that were not American and what he uh, and that they were that they had an influence that was outsized um, at, at a time when there was absolutely no evidence of this, um, and that uh, they were pushing Americans against their will into this war. Um, and so he was, he was actively campaigning on this. Now, much of what he uh, thought and wrote about Jews, in fact, uh, hasn't seen the light of day. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, going through his papers there at the Yale University Library. He kept daily entries in, in these small diary books that he had. And uh, I was shocked to read just how obsessed he was with Jews. You know, he was convinced that Jews were uh, sabotaging his events, um, that they were uh, trying to undermine his reputation. And he was also convinced that they were going to be subject to violence in this country greater than what happened in Germany to, to Jews. I'm Stan Brock. Thirty years ago, I formed Remote Area Medical to help people overseas. But then we found generations of families in America isolated by poverty from the health care they need. Together, we can take dental, vision, and medical help to a million adults and their kids right here at home in the United States of America. If you'd like to order the book we're talking about, please go to DougMilesMedia.com and enter the author's name in the Amazon search box. Thank you for listening. Please come back soon for more conversations here at DougMilesMedia.com. This has been a presentation of Doug Miles Media, all rights reserved. You can listen to or download previous programs at iTunes, Stitcher.com, or Doug Miles Media.